listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 30, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, fever syndromes. Our presenter is Dr. Jordan Pitt. He's an allergy immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to COLA Lecture. Today is October 30th of 2020. Um, today's lecture will be on fever syndrome by one of our fellows, Dr. Jordan Pitt. He's our first year fellow. And um, take it away. Um, so my first slide um, is just some motivation for y'all out there to pay attention um, and uh, basically this this quote from Middleton um, because periodic fever syndromes are pretty rare um, you know we're not going to see them all the time and uh, may not even be the ones necessarily to manage them but Middleton um, has this to say about auto-inflammatory um, disorders in general and says it is likely that each of these conditions will be amenable to specific therapeutic intervention as the immune mechanisms are better understood but given their direct connections to immune pathways it is important for allergists to claim understanding of these diseases so I think both from a research standpoint and from um, a diagnostic standpoint we should be aware of these things uh, that being said out of the 1,600 plus pages of Middleton, there's only about one page um, dedicated to these disorders. Um, so I think the moral of, of the story there is that uh, we, we should know very well the basics of these things. Um, so kind of starting with a big picture view um, of auto-inflammatory disorders, more I would say most people are pretty familiar with autoimmune diseases uh, more so than autoinflammatory disorders. So autoimmune diseases are disorders uh, more so of the adaptive immune system and often include autoantibodies and specific alleles to uh, major histocompatibility complex. Um, again, I think we're familiar with those from things like lupus. Um, so, but just to kind of contrast, to give us a setting for autoinflammatory disorders, these are disorders more so of the innate immune system and involve inappropriate activation of antigen-independent inflammatory mechanisms and thus lack autoantibodies and MHC mutations. Um, so I think for myself that was helpful, uh, a helpful comparison. Um, however, the lines are blurred a little bit. Um, people do feel like in autoimmune diseases, they do have some components of autoinflammation. And in autoinflammatory disorders, there may be some um, adaptive immune cell involvement as well. So um, lines are kind of blurred, but give some kind of context for these autoinflammatory disorders. Um, <clears throat> so there is a newer classification of autoinflammatory disorders put out by the IUIS, or the International Union of Immunological Societies, um, and um, so for most of these autoinflammatory disorders, they arise from single gene mutations um, and affect the immune system, but are not considered primary immunodeficiencies, so they have their own classification. And this classification um, divides them up into three main groups. The first is um, interferonopathies, which are um, immunoproteasome dysfunction, which leads to accumulation of abnormal, abnormal proteins in the production of type 1 interferon. Um, and these often um, result in severe cutaneous inflammation as well as fevers. Um, and then inflammasomopathies, um, also known as 
familial fever syndromes um, include in, inflammasome dysfunction, which leads to increased IL-1 and TNF, as well as abnormal fever response and chronic effects, effects of inflammation, such as amyloid formation and deposition. Um, and then um, there is a third um, category, and that's kind of these single gene mutations that lead to uncontrolled inflammation but don't really fit into either of the other categories. So just kind of a third wastebasket category. Um, so these inflammasomopathies or familiar familial fever syndromes, um, also known as periodic fever syndrome. The word periodic um, really denotes that they happen at regular intervals, which is pretty rare for these disorders. Um, so they would be more appropriately called episodic fever syndromes, more so than periodic. Um, but they are single gene mutations, and so they are familial. Um, so they are called that as well. Um, up on the top, you can see a picture of an inflammasome, um, which I thought was just really pretty cool looking, um, how all these different pieces work together. Um, but as far as the, the fever syndromes go, um, each condition is separate um, and has different guidelines for diagnosis and management. And there are five main syndromes. Uh, the first is familial Mediterranean fever. And is tumor necrosis factor periodic syndrome. The third is mevalonate kinase deficiency or hyper ICD syndrome. Um, and then the fourth is cryopyrin associated periodic syndromes. And then the fifth, I kind of separated. Um, it's periodic fever with aphthys, stomatitis, pharyngitis, and adenitis. Um, and that one um, is a little bit different. We'll kind of get more into it later. Um, so it's considered a fever syndrome, um, but it's just a little bit different than the other ones. So we'll fo focus more so on the other ones. Um, so I was wishing that they would have named them a little bit differently so that they could be TRAPS, CAPS, HIAPS, FMAPS, FAPS, um, so they, they could all rhyme, but unfortunately um, we're stuck with TRAPS, CAPS, and FMF and IDS. Um, so just a reminder, not all syndromes of fever are fever syndromes. Um, so this is kind of what is your differential um, when you see a patient with um, recurrent fever episodes. So some things to consider would be unusual infections, um, kind of like a fever of unknown origin sort of presentation. Um, there's a condition called relapsing fever, which is caused by uh, spirochetes of the Borrelia genus, um, and so can cause these recurrent fevers um, that are not uh, familial fever syndromes. Uh, of course, malignancy could present with um, prominent fevers, um, pre-malignant states such as Schnitzler syndrome um, can have intermittent fevers as well as the other things you see listed. And then um, cyclic neutropenia, um, like I had said before, um, besides PFAPA, most of these are not really periodic. Um, Whereas citric, cyclic neutropenia is, um, is actually pretty periodic. So patients who had a very consistent pattern to their recurrent fevers, um, it could be related to uh, cyclic neutropenia and infections. And then um, systemic uh, JIA can result in high spiking daily fevers. Um, and some of these symptoms may actually present prior to arthritis. So um, may not be as clear initially for JIA. Um, 
So, in general, when should I include fever syndromes in my differential diagnosis? Um, so, patients may present to allergy and immunology clinics for the evaluation of different things, not just recurrent fevers. Um, they could be referred because of concern for immunodeficiency, allergic reactions, or um, even urticaria. Um, and then on um, more history, um, then you would see if these, these patients are having fevers that recur over months to years without associated infections, then definitely we would be concerned for fever syndromes. Um, other common symptoms in these fever symptom syndromes include abdominal pain, rashes, myalgias, arthralgias, and arthritis. Um, and then most of these also, um, especially when they're flaring, um, as far as lab results go, you would see leukocytosis and elevated inflammatory markers. So once we've thought, hey, this could be a um, fever syndrome, then we have to kind of start thinking what, you know, which one could it be? Um, so some of the important things to um, elicit are um, trying to identify a clinical fever pattern, both the duration and the frequency of the fevers. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like we do this a lot in, in clinical practice, but ask um, families to keep a journal of, of different things. And so this may require that um, families are good at keeping a fever journal so we can better see the, the timing. Um, also, identifying the age of onset. Um, we'll see later that these diseases, um, some of them present at different times, so that can be helpful as well. Um, ethnicity can be helpful with um, kind of pointing you in some directions rather than others. And then uh, review of systems is also really important. Um, looking for um, these sim symptoms, abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, chest pain, and also other symptoms um, that will help kind of point you in one direction or the other. Um, exam could be helpful um, looking for abnormal um, or like syndromic facies um, or splenomegaly with the um, exam. And then um, oftentimes the um, the process of diagnosing these disorders um, can take time. And so um, in a lot of things that I read, they say that you can consider kind of doing an empiric therapeutic trial, um, treating with one of these uh, medications that is known to be beneficial in these fever syndromes. Um, as, you know, both um, therapeutic but also diagnostic, seeing if, if the patients respond. Um, and then, of course, genetic testing um, is important in the diagnosis of which autoinflammatory um, or fever syndrome they have. And there are um, gene panels out there that you can order that are specific for autoinflammatory diseases. Um, so as as they always say in presentations like this, the most important thing in your workup is genetic testing. Okay, not, not usually genetic testing. Um, usually we focus on history, and um, I think in that, this case that is also true, um, that history is really going to point you on the right path. Um, but this is um, also these are also um, syndromes that genetic testing is very beneficial. So first history and then um, gene testing. So this is a table from, um, from up to date. And basically to, to summarize it, so these are some of the different um, types of fever syndromes that we've talked about. 
And basically all of them up here say, if you have a known mutation in this specific gene, um, plus you have one symptom of the known main symptoms for each of these diseases, then you can diagnose the disease. Um, and then a few of them have um, kind of the caveat that if you have a gene mutation that's not necessarily known um, to cause the disease, but um, is in that gene and you have two symptoms uh, of the main symptoms, then you can also diagnose the disease. So kind of those two ways of doing it, but again, your history in knowing what they're um, experiencing as well as genetic testing is important. Um, this next little flow sheet I thought was interesting. It actually um, comes from a dermatology journal, so kind of odd there, um, but just kind of gives you an idea of, um, you know, really trying to establish that fever pattern and the duration of the fevers and how that can help you in your differential of which um, fever syndrome you may be dealing with. Okay, so now getting into each of the specific disorders. Um, the first one, familial, familial Mediterranean fever. Um, so this is one where the uh, family ethnicity can be super helpful in um, kind of getting you clinical suspicion for this disorder. So you can see more common in, um, in those ethnic ethnicities listed above. Um, the age of presentation is also very helpful in distinguishing. Um, so for this, it usually starts um, in the second decade of life, so between 10 and 20. Um, but can uh, present later than that, but rarely after kind of middle age. Um, so the genetics of this disorder, it's a gene of function mutation in the MEFV gene. And um, it's actually, there's some debate as to whether this is autosomal recessive um, versus autosomal dominant with limited penetrance. So I think typically it's been um, reported as autosomal recessive, but some people have been found um, to, to clinically have this disease and only have um, one mutation. And so they're thinking now that this may be um, more appropriately classified as autosomal dominant with limited penetrance. Um, so in terms of the pathophysiology, the MEFV gene um, encodes for the protein pyrin, um, which functions to regulate production of IL-1 beta. And the mutation leads to a more active pyrin and uh, more active pyrin inflammasome, which propagates inflammation via IL-1 and IL-18. Um, the fever pattern, the duration is usually pretty short, one to three days at a time. Um, and the frequency couldn't really find a good um, good number as to the frequency. So I think this is one where um, it's, it's not really consistent as far as how often they're having these episodes. Um, some associated features with this um, abdominal pain, chest pain, arthritis, arthritis, um, serositis, synovitis, leukocytosis, and elevated acute phase reactants. Um, and we'll talk about this more, but secondary amyloidosis. Um, that's kind of the, the end result of untreated disease in each of these. Um, and so it's what we're wanting to try and prevent. Um, so treatment is going to be similar um, throughout each of these diseases, but um, some small variations that are worth noting. So uh, for FMF, um, it's important to initiate colchicine um, at the time of diagnosis. So that's kind of been the best first-line um, treatment. Um, besides that, you can consider IL-1 blockade um, with anakinra or 
um, these other medications, um, as well as TNF-alpha inhibition with etanercept um, or the other medications listed there. Um, so that is um, FMF. Um, so TRAPS was previously known as familial Hibernian fever, um, which is another word for Irish, or familial periodic fever. Um, so obviously ethnic, ethnicity is Irish, uh, but this one's been seen in, in many other ethnic groups. So the Irish ethnicity is not necessarily something really important in um, having clinical suspicion for this. Um, patient is the all the way up to the 40s or beyond, um, but more than half develop in the first decade. Um, the genetics for this one is um, TNFR1 gene mutation, and this one is autosomal dominant with incomplete penetrance. Um, so with that mutation, there's altered intracellular TNF receptor trafficking, which fosters reactive oxygen species production and subsequent NL NLRP3 inflammasome activation. So again, kind of similar trends where these are all inflammasomes. Um, we're kind of causing these different inflammasomes to be overly activated and lead to a pro-inflammatory state. Um, the fever pattern for this one is five days to two weeks, sometimes more, um, and can happen as often as every five to six weeks. Um, and this one's been seen to be more so triggered by physical or emotional stresses. Um, associated features with this one, um, conjunctivitis, periorbital edema, myalgias, rash. Um, this rash is kind of fairly characteristic. Um, it's erythematous patches, which, which spread distally down an extremity, um, and then also abdominal pain and arthritis. So as you can see, again, some similarities with the presentation, um, but also some, some differences. Um, treatment for this one, um, NSAIDs and corticosteroids can um, provide symptom relief, but they don't really, um, especially NSAIDs, don't really address the underlying inflammation. Um, corticosteroids can at first, but lose effic efficacy over time. Um, same with the Tanercept, that um, that can kind of be beneficial initially, but um, not as good over time. Um, Anakinra has been shown to be the most efficacious um, over time for these patients. Um, you could also consider other IL-1 blockade. Um, and then um, it's recommended not to use um, and then some, some patients can have um, atypical disease where it's not quite as severe. Um, and in children, oftentimes they don't need any prophylaxis medication. Um, and adults, they may respond just to um, colchicine or corticosteroids kind of um, as, you know, kind of more mild treatment or um, intermittent treatment. Um, so some, some variation in um, disease presentation and treatment. Um, the next disease is hyper-IgD syndrome, also known as mevalonate kinase deficiency. Um, so this ethnicity um, associated with this disease is Dutch or French, um, but also others again. Um, age of presentation is um, usually within the first year of life. Uh, the majority of people present at that time. Um, in this disease, there is a loss of function mutation of the MVK gene. It is still more obsessive um, in inheritance. And it results in a reduction in mevalonic kinase activity, um, leading to alteration in cholesterol and non-serol and suprenoid pathway, which promotes inflammation. Um, so this one, trying to go through the, the pathophysiology, um, 
some things weren't perfectly known and it was um, a little bit confusing. It's um, a little bit different of a pathway than we usually think about, but again, results in, um, in this inflammatory state. Um, and um, there's, well, okay, so the, um, the fever pattern, um, the duration for this one is usually three to seven days and um, can happen as often as every one to two months. Um, and there's been a, a pretty consistent association with um, attacks occurring after things like vaccination viral infections, trauma, and stress. Um, but I think this, this can happen in all of these diseases, um, but in some of them, it's, it's more typical that there's kind of a triggering um, event to an exacerbation. Um, associated features, um, when they have the fever, this fever often is unremitting, um, meaning it just is persistent the entire duration that they have it, um, despite uh, antipyretics and, and trying to treat it. Um, they can also have chills, cervical lymphadenopathy, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, abs, aphthous ulcerations, um, rash as well with this one, splenomegaly, um, and then some um, lab findings that are um, helpful in diagnosing this without genetic um, genetic labs um, would include checking an IgD level um, and that would typically be greater than 100 um, and these patients also often have an elevated IgA level and acute phase reactants um, so yeah Something kind of unique about this one is that we have some other laboratory findings that can um, help us in the diagnosis before um, going to genetic testing. Um, for HIDS, uh, treatment is similar. Um, so NSAIDs um, can be helpful in acute settings. Uh, and um, can help the symptoms, but really don't help the inflammation too much. Um, these patients would need high-dose corticosteroids um, to help treat their attacks. And then similarly, anakinra or other IL-1 blockade um, are very good preventative um, daily, or not daily, but um, prophylactic medications to try and prevent these attacks from occurring, um, as well as TNF alpha in inhibition, um, IL-6 blockade. And in these patients, um, there have some, been some who have required um, metaphoric cell transplantation um, to treat their disease. And then unlike um, some of the others where we would use colchicine, um, it's recommended that you don't use colchicine in the treatment of hyper IDD syndrome. Um, so the next is cryopyrin associated periodic syndromes, and I underline the S um, in caps because this is a family of um, three, three syndromes. Um, they're also known as cryopyrinopathies, and so the three syndromes, you have kind of your more mild one, um, which is familial cold auto-inflammatory syndrome, a more moderate one, which is Muckle-Wells syndrome, and a severe one, which is neonatal onset multi-systemic inflammatory disorder. And I feel like you can tell just from the name um, that that one is not, not a good one to have. Um, for CAPS, there is no you know, specific ethnicity um, that they have been tied to. Um, all of these different disorders re result from a gain-of-function mutation in the NLRP3 uh, gene, which encodes 
cryopyrene, and um, these disorders are autosomal dominant with variable penetrance, as we've seen before. Um, the cryopyrin is a scaffold protein that helps in the assembly of the inflammasome, um, which then leads to cleaving of the pro-IL-1 beta into its mature inflammatory form. And so the mutation leads to aberrant production of IL-1 beta and also increased IL-18. Um, so similar players that we've seen in some of the other ones with IL-1 and IL-18. Um, treatment is um, with IL-1 blockade, um, and this can help stabilize and improve organ damage. Um, and then again, NSAIDs, corticosteroids can help with acute attacks. So Anakinra specifically can be used for all um, CAPs, and especially those with central nervous system inflammation. Um, that would be more so your NOMID. Um, and that's because of uh, increased ability to penetrate the blood-brain bar barrier of anakinra versus canakinab. Um, but that can be used for all counts as well. And then rylonacept is a soluble IL-1 beta decoy receptor, um, which can be used for... Um, for the uh, first two disorders and caps. Um, so going into each of those individually, um, so familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome, um, previously known as familial cold urticaria, it usually presents with, within the first year of life, and um, its fever pattern is less than 24 hours in duration. Um, so typically, these patients develop symptoms within one to seven hours after cold exposure um, and consists of fever, conjunctival injection, arthralgias, necropapular or urticarial rashes, um, and leukocytosis. Um, so the kind of classic um, situation is these patients are out in the like the heat outside, and then um, go into a really cold, air-conditioned house, um, and even that kind of change in temperature with the cold um, can trigger symptoms. But it's interesting to to note that the onset of symptoms are you know, fairly delayed, um, but often people will be able to kind of notice this cold as being a, a trigger. Um, so a picture there of, of a urticarial-like rash in um, FCAS. Um, so the next is Muckle-Wells syndrome. So the age for presentation is pretty variable. Um, the fever pattern is usually a duration of 12 to 36 hours and can occur as often as every few weeks. Um, other symptoms that they have include urticarial rashes, others typically cold associated. Um, they, they can also have progressive sensorineural neural hearing loss, um, secondary systemic AA amyloidosis with nephropathy, um, headache, arthralgias, and arthritis. Um, so as I was doing some reading, I came across this news article of this man who um, had these recurrent rashes and fevers and went to, it says, dozens of doctors. So lots of different doctors, including an allergist. Um, and was not, uh, they were not able to find a diagnosis for him. Um, so he kind of decided that he was never going to get an answer, and so he just kind of dropped it. Um, but then he had his first daughter, and she started exhibiting similar, um, similar symptoms to him. So he again started his hunt 
to try and find an answer. And so what he did was he started um, just looking through Google Images to try and find a rash that looked like the rash that he got. Um, and apparently he eventually found a rash that looked like his rash and went into his doctor and said, hey, I'm concerned that I have this disease. And so he was eventually tested for it and was found to have muckle wells syndrome. So the moral of the story with this is that if we don't know well enough about these diseases, then we are consigning people to Dr. Google, which I don't think we typically want to do. Um, so anyways, I just thought it was a, an interesting um, news article and story. Um, so this last one, NOMID, um, is also known as chronic infantile neurologic cutaneous and articular syndrome, or SINCA. Um, and onset is really from birth, and the fevers can be pretty continuous without treatment. Um, and as the, uh, the SINCA name kind of gives away, um, the associated features include persistent rashes, um, a migratory erythematous rash resembling urticaria, um, chronic meningitis, cartonal cartilaginous or bony deformities, including abnormal facies, uh, sensorineural hearing loss, uveitis, um, amyloidosis, and premature death. Um, so as was previously mentioned, this is definitely more severe than some of the others and um, can lead to, to poor outcomes. Um, here's a picture of a baby with um, this rash that you'd see in NOMED. And then um, I found this blog called the no NOMED Nomad, which I thought was a clever name. Um, but apparently this individual um, is, you know, did not have premature death, is still living, and um, is dealing with this disease. But you can see, you know, has um, some uh, clinical features um, that um, you know, she is dealing with. Um, so I thought that was interesting to see um, an older, a picture of an older individual um, with this disorder. Okay, so now to PFAPA. Um, if you were trained um, in pediatrics, and this is probably fairly familiar. Um, I feel like a lot of pediatricians are, are pretty aware of this um, disorder and um, are able to kind of make an appropriate um, referral for this. Um, PFAPA is a little different than the others. It doesn't have a known single gene mutation and so may not actually be a true autoinflammatory syndrome, um, really like all of the other autoinflammatory sy syndromes that we've been talking about. Um, I think that this one kind of gets lumped in um, with the, quote, periodic fever syndromes um, because it actually is the most periodic um, fever syndrome in, in, as far as the symptoms are pretty consistent, um, re recurring um, every three to four weeks and lasting three to six days. Um, and so is in this category, but is not so much um, a issue with the immune system um, like the others are. Um, these patients have pharyngitis, uh, mild aphthous ulcerations, lymphadenopathy, chills, fatigue, headache, mild abdominal pain, um, and increased inflammatory markers. So this often kind of stems out of um, like school age coming in for recurrent um, strep throat. Um, because as you can see, it presents with some of these similar symptoms, pharyngitis and headaches and fevers. 
Um, but once this pattern kind of um, establishes itself and it's so regular, then um, the PCP has more of that clinical suspicion. Um, and so most of these patients will not come to allergy. They will be sent to ENT um, as at least in some subset of these patients, tonsillectomy can be curative or can kind of get rid of these reoccurring fevers. Um, these patients can also be treated with steroids. Um, so just a word about diagnosis and treatment. So the reason why um, these patients are it's important to diagnose them accurately and treat them um, because there are potential implications for therapy. We've got, now gone through each of the cases um, or each of the conditions and you see there's a lot of similarities but also some differences, um, specifically, you know, use colchicine first line one disorder versus, okay, it really shouldn't be used in this other disorder. So, um, it's good to have an accurate diagnosis so that we can make um, the appropriate treatment choices. Um, also, um, it's important to um, know that they are have a, a fever syndrome so that we can treat them appropriately to um, develop or prevent development of secondary amyloidosis. Um, so this is typically a um, designated as secondary capital A, capital A amyloidosis, and it's characterized by extracellular tissue deposition of, of fibrils that are composed of serum amyloid A protein, which is a hepatic acute phase reactant and can affect a variety of organs, including the kidney and the heart. Um, the kidney is definitely the most frequently affected and often leads to nephrotic syndrome, um, but can also lead to other um, abnormalities with the, the kidney. And tissue biopsy is necessary to confirm the presence of amyloid and make the diagnosis of amyloidosis. Um, so all of these diseases put these patients at risk for um, development of this, and so treatment of these diseases is going to um, help prevent those major complications. Um, as far as genetic counseling, um, a lot of these are autosomal dominant, but with limited penetrance. So I think that that's kind of an interesting situation um, where families really need to be aware of the implications of that. that it's <coughs> autosomal dominant, so definitely um, could be passed on a lot, uh, but then that limited penetrance really makes it variable and unknown. Um, so it's important for families to understand. Um, so if you are working up these patients and um, you know you've done genetic testing and everything, and it seems negative, or it is negative, but it seems like these patients or this patient really does have a true familial fever syndrome, um, then you can consider expanded genetic testing and call that some sequencing, um, trying to look at more and see what you can find. And um, even with that, if, if you are not finding a specific genetic um, mutation, but your clinical suspicion is high, again, you can um, start empiric therapy that's patterned on that which we would use in, in known autoinflammatory diseases um, and just do that empirically to see how the patient responds. Um, because genetic testing takes a long time and really they're finding new, new mutations all the time that cause these autoinflammatory diseases, um, it's, it's totally warranted to, to just treat them empirically. Um, I did my pediatric training at Phoenix Children's Hospital in Arizona, um, and there we had an immunohematology uh, multidisciplinary clinic where we would see 
a lot of um, these patients, um, still not a lot, but that was, they were more frequent in that clinic than anywhere else, for sure. Um, and so often we would spend a lot of time working on a diagnosis of these patients. Um, sometimes we would find a specific uh, gene mutation. A lot of times we would find variants of unknown significance, um, but would you know, treat them empirically anyways. Um, and once, once we made a diagnosis for these patients, um, oftentimes we actually, in that clinic, sent them to rheumatology for treatment and monitoring. Um, and the reasoning for that was just that they're more familiar with a lot of the medications that are used to treat these disorders than uh, we may be in the allergy and immunology world. So I'm not saying that that's the right or the wrong thing to do. Um, but I thought that that was kind of a, an interesting approach and at least made sense in some respects um, as far as just being more aware of the medications and, and what sort of monitoring might need to take place. Um, and then really in all of these, um, these disorders, um, Anna Kinra, um, IL-1 blocker is a good um, option. I think across the board, they, they all respond well to it. So that would be a good one to kind of use for empiric treatment to see if they respond. Um, so now just a quick summary of the things that we talked about. Uh, fever syndromes are important for allergists to be aware of. Um, it's important to consider your differential and to rule out other causes of fever, especially malignancy. Um, the pathophysiology is not well understood for each of these disorders, um, but besides PFAPA, um, seem to involve single gene mutations causing inflammasome dysfunction and innate immune system activation. Um, there are some similarities and differences in the presentation of these syndromes. Um, many of them will have fevers that recur over months with rashes, abdominal pain, myalgias, arthralgias, and arthritis as well as leukocytosis and elevated inflammatory marker. Um, but as you've seen, there are differences in fever duration and frequency, predominant ethnicities, and age of presentation. Um, diagnosis involves genetic testing, but empiric treatment is reasonable prior to confirmation or when genetic tested. testing is negative for no mutation. And um, treatment similarities and differences, um, most can, you can use NSAIDs and steroids for acute attacks um, and IL-1 blockade for prophylaxis. And then others, <coughs> um, well, some will have varying responses to TNF-alpha inhibition, colchicine, and IL-6 blockade. And then again, the goal of treatment is both symptom control for the patient and prevention of secondary amyloidosis and further complications, um, especially um, in the kidneys. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, so I um, put together this morning just a couple of little kind of case questions. Um, I know that we're not great um, on here at, at participating, but if you want to humor me, I would appreciate it. Um, this the first case is a 15-year-old Italian patient referred to your clinic for recurrent fevers. Over the past year, the patient has been having random episodes of two consecutive days of fever with abdominal pain and nothing else, also with no pertinent family history. Anybody want to um, guess which fever syndrome this might be? Uh, oh, nice. Somebody put FMF on the chat, and that is correct. Um, that is what I was going for. So um, we see the Italian ethnicity in a couple different ones, um, but the big thing for FMF would be um, the two consecutive days of fever, so the one to three days, um, abdominal pain, 
doesn't really have a rash, and um, this is the one that typically has been thought of as autosomal recessive, so often won't have a family history. Um, so we'll say this is now the same patient, but we'll, we'll vary it a little bit and say that the episodes last about one week. And the patient um, also develops significant rash with their symptoms. Any guesses for this one? So, 15-year-old Italian patient, recurrent fevers lasting a week, abdominal pain, and rash. Awesome. Thank you, Farzad, for participating and getting it right. So, this is TRAPS. All right, third question, you're consulted on an inpatient, two-month-old uh, French patient, sorry, due to two episodes of fever lasting one week without subsiding, and the second episode started after he got his two-month vaccines. So remember, there was one that was typically associated with um, certain triggers, including getting vaccines. Hannah for the win. Thanks, Anna. Um, and Farzad again. Nice job. So this would be hyper-IgD syndrome. So again, a sort of similar consult, but the patient's a little bit younger, one month old, and has been having almost daily fevers with significant rash, and also has some syndromic facies. Sinka or Nomad, Jordan? Uh, yes, thanks, Sean. Um, no men, definitely. So, again, uh, and Hannah, yes, no men. Um, so, almost constant fevers, significant rash, syndromic feces, basically from birth. Um, and then last one, one-year-old presents to clinic due to concern for allergy to the cold. Whenever the patient goes from a warm area to a cold area, he later develops hives and fevers that last less than 24 hours. And mom is just that be allergic to the cold. Um, yes, Hannah says FCAS, and that was yeah, kind of a kind of a gimme, but yes, that is correct, Hannah. Nice. Um, so that is all for my questions for you. If you have any questions for me then um, feel free. We have a couple minutes left. I don't, um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in these things, but uh, I have at least seen a couple of them back in residency and did a lot of reading. Here are my references and a quick picture of my family because I love them. And uh, my kids are really cute. And so if there's any questions, I'll take them now. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Pitt? Well, thanks, Jordan, for the great talk. No problem. Thanks, Mary. Have a good weekend, everyone. Don't forget to switch your clock back an hour. Ugh. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Jordan.